Hi everybody, this is Nate from The Kramer Life. And Katie. Also from The Kramer Life. And we're gonna walk you through our current setup of our 60 acre homestead that we've been on for a year and a half now. And we're gonna just show you the animals, talk through how we've utilized them so far and what our plans for them are moving forward. See, we'll start uh, right here. We'll just kind of start right behind you in the carport and talk about how we're storing the feed. And then we'll kind of make our way out of the center of our operations, which is right here by the house. All right, we are in the carport and this is where we store uh, all of our feed. And they're currently sitting on top of a pallet and that are stacked on some cinder blocks. Our main way of storing this is not out in the open like this. It's actually inside 50 gallon barrels. That way we can control uh, who, who gets access to it, because sometimes the birds will come up here and peck through the bags. <laughs> um, we want to make sure we control rat and mice and rodent population as well. Either they'll stay in here in the carport or we'll have the 50 gallon barrels over by the uh, stations where the animals are. Yeah, we have a food and a water station at every setup so that it makes it easier for maintaining the, the different sections, especially the further away from the house that we get. So this is the back half of the carport. It's actually sectioned off with a, its own separate entrance. So what we're utilizing this for is storing our hay and our bedding and our shavings and things like that that we don't want the animals to have free access to. It'll be what the sheep overwinter with. So it's alfalfa and... Timothy hay, Timothy hay. and orchard hay. All right, let's talk about this area. <laughs> See if we can beat the rain. This is our setup for our free rangers. And then also it's kind of our temporary holding for a lot of the other chickens as they're growing up, getting large enough to be able to be introduced to other flocks. So this is our OG coop. This is what we built originally when we got our first eight hens. And since then, it has <laughs> expanded. Our flock is now 18 hens, and we have two roosters in it currently. These girls right here, these are our Rhode Island red pullets. These are part of our breeding stock. So our chicken operations is set up in a couple different ways. We have our free range hens that are for our egg production. That's for our personal consumption, and we are wanting to put a little box down by the road to do eggs for neighbors and things like that and to sell them. Our second part of our chicken production is going to be our breeding stock where we're breeding purebred uh, pure chickens with different varieties for either backyard flocks or ones that are good for homestead situations, free rangers, things like that. So these pullets that are in here are part of that operation and we have Rhode Island red roosters on the other side that we're going to be integrating them in with. You'll see a lot of these little gray coops. These are uh, Avatuan uh, style coops. They're easy to set up. Mm -hmm. They're lightweight. They're relatively cheap. And so we have a few of these around the property that we use for different purposes. Like when we have uh, baby chicks that are ready to go out on grass, we'll put them into there until they get to a certain age that they can come out of it. Um, so we do find having several of those around portable and uh, easy to move has been a lifesaver for us. So you'll see here also that we have a couple stations of free uh, choice food. So this is all flock feed right here. And the geese, um, um, Kinsley, Kinsley. And, and currently our dogs too, um, <laughs> the geese will come over here and eat. We have it raised up so that way we can try to keep some of the chickens uh, <laughs> from eating it. But that's a good source of food for the geese, that and the grass. Yeah, and we do that because when we were feeding the babies and the chick, the free range flock, the geese would eat all of the food and we'd have to put like 30, 40 piles around. So this made it so they know that they have their own feeding station and we raised it up. Now they leave the chickens alone. This right here is our last batch of hatched out barnyard mix. So we had three hens that went broody and we went ahead and allowed them to hatch out their eggs and once they decided that they were done raising them we went ahead and put them into this area and we'll keep them in here until they are big enough that the hawks and other ground predators hopefully won't be able to pick them up so just started putting some wood chips in here. We'll do grass clipping wood chips and do some deep bedding in here to keep it clean because they don't have that access to fresh greens all the time. And the little gray coop, the reason that is in there is we had some that were smaller 
that we were introducing in, we put that in there and kept them enclosed so they could acclimate. But right now they're all roosting and sleeping on the roosting bars. And you'll notice we do have one rooster in here. And so Jack in there, he's our Americana. We've kept him in there because he does such a great job. With the little chicks, he keeps them straight and we don't have any issues. So these are gonna be part of our free range flock. All of the hens will keep and the roosters will end up uh, either gifting or selling. These are going to be dark Brahmas and leg bars and then the little black ones there's four black ones in there those are actually frizzle cochins and <laughs> two of them have the frizzle characteristics uh, but two of them do not so the gene is dominant all the way through but i think one in four don't have the characteristic and then right here we have we have blue our ragtag rooster that we we're not sure where to put him and then the silver lace coach in. You'll, you'll see here that the different stations have different types of watering and feeding. Uh, these two here, they just have a, a two gallon bucket. We just keep that thing fresh, freshly filled. Tractor supply brand. And then this is an old style feeder. So they can just do some uh, free choice feeding. So speaking of the feeding, in this case, we're storing all of the feed inside this tote here. It's just inside, just rained. So we just put the bags inside here and then close it up. And we do have uh, trail cams, just trying to make sure that everyone's safe and seeing, you know, what happens throughout the evenings and, and throughout the day, what other animals are present in the area. Yeah, we recently did have an issue with a raccoon. And so we've been, keeping a really close eye over the last week, trying to <laughs> see if that raccoon is coming back or not. We do have the, have cameras up in various places just so us, so we can see what's going on when we're not out here. All right, so this is one example of 50 gallon barrel that we use for water. That's for all of the animals up over here. And then we'll have something similar to that over to over where the pigs are. So let's go check out the pigs. This is where our pigs are currently. And I say currently because we move the animals around the property as we want them to clear the different sections. So right now they have approximately three acres. And this is kind of their base of our base of operations where we feed them every morning and evening when we do chores, we make sure that they have extra water. This is a extra watering station if we need it. We use that, this is our food, we use the water here to mix the food. And so in this bucket, we'll put the food, we'll add water, and we'll give them kind of a mash every day. And they hear us, so here they come. <laughs> Hi, Amy. <laughs> Hi, buddy. <laughs> Hello. There's no food for you. <laughs> it's not feeding time. <laughs> Hi. So they know this is where we feed them. And so they come up here and they have several wallows like this around the around their areas. As you can see, they were in this area for a little while and we kind of filled back in their wallow holes but if we leave them in an area too long, they'll get pretty big. When we got these two pigs, we also got two others and they were put into the freezer. So these are Mangalitsta uh, Berkshire mix pigs and the two that are in the freezer are Red Waddle Berk, um, Berkshire mix. The primary purpose for these animals, food and the land clearing. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that these two haven't gone in the freezer yet is because we just don't have room in the freezer and we really don't need the meat yet. We're still working on the meat from the, the first, first two pigs. So we have these geese, so we call them the shenanigans. We haven't given them individual names yet. I'm not sure that they're gonna get individual names. They're free roaming. Do you know what type of geese they are? They're embedding. Embedding mm -hmm. geese, okay. They're about, about two months old at, at this point. Yeah. And they, go around, they eat bugs, they eat lots of grass, they'll eat feed. Um, they'll alert us if there's anything in the area that they don't like in the area. 
sometimes that includes dogs and other chickens. <laughs> so their area is their area and wherever they are, that's their area. <laughs> <laughs> and they've got a couple pool, we got a couple kiddie pools set up. We dump these out and give them fresh water every single day and it still looks like that. <laughs> yeah, it looks like that about two minutes after <laughs> we put fresh water in. <laughs> so they have this big pool here and they have a little bit of a smaller one right here and they do, they get the fresh water every day. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna head up uh, to the east side of the house up by the gray barn and show you what we have going on up there. This is our operations up here. The majority of this is going to be our breeding operations. So a lot of the younger, the pullets and the younger hens are down in the other area until they're large enough to be introduced to the roosters. Up here, this is predominantly roosters. We only have seven hens up here and the rest are all roosters. One of the breeding pairs we're going to do is those Rhode Island red pullets that were down there. We're going to introduce them to one of these uh, enclosures and they will have a rooster with them. A Rhode Island red rooster? Correct. Mm -hmm. These are our meat birds and they will be mixed with a Rhode Island red rooster. Currently the leg bar rooster is in here with them but his his females were down in the other coop and they're about ready to be introduced to him. The reason this leg bar is currently with the meat girls is because he was being picked on pretty heavily by other roosters that we have around here, so we needed to separate them. So we figured, just put him with the meat girls for now and we'll put them with his intended girls once they're of age. We're letting the girls lay on the ground right now. We've tried putting a couple different nesting boxes in there and they just haven't taken to them. I think they're just so big that it's just not comfortable for them to get into the nesting box. So we'll play around and we'll have to do a different design that's more equipped for birds of this size. Yeah, they, they need to have a little bit lower <laughs> of a perch because they can't jump as high. And when they jump off the perch, we don't want them to hurt themselves mm -hmm. because they are heavy birds. So yeah. their design will have to stay lower than most. Yeah. Now the way that we have these chickens housed out here is we have three hoop coops that we built with um, two by fours and cattle panel, chicken wire, and hardware cloth. Each of them have their own run that is fenced in with uh, Premier One chicken netting. Each of them are about the same size because it's the same amount of, of netting, except for the center one. The center one actually is a little bit bigger because it attaches to the netting from the outside coops. And so it gets a little bit bigger of an area. And since the, these meat birds here are actually really good foragers, we give them this, this space so they can do some foraging. We found that roosters are not as good foragers as hens are, so they're, they're just, they don't need as much space. The last hoop coop, what we have in here is we have five roosters. They're all waiting for the hens to be of size. So there's two black osterlopes, there's two silver laced cochins, and there's one salmon faverel. The silver laced cochins, they're actually gonna be separated and one of the males will go with a silver laced cochin female and then the other one will go with an assorted uh, group of cochins. So we'll have a kind of unique different variety so we get different colors. But the hope is that that silver lacing kind of breeds dominant throughout. And we're hoping to add one of the black osterlopes to our free range group. The way that these hoop coops are laid out, they have a front door and then there's currently just a single roosting bar. It's about two feet or so off the ground. The meat birds one is, is one foot off the ground. We will build nesting boxes into the back once they start laying. And then we'll probably set up some sort of a little area for chicks to be isolated as the area becomes more set up for breeding. And to each of the enclosures, we actually have a gate that opens fully. And this is so if we need to get the, the lawnmower in, the wheelbarrow, the wheelbarrow, anything. So when we refresh their deep bedding, um, adding more wood chips or anything like that, You'll notice there's a gate on every single entrance, including going between the hoop coops. 
and they just clasp back on. Water and food setup is about the same here. Uh, we have this 50 gallon barrel that's holding the dry food, the feed, and we keep the feed in their bags uh, just because there's this one, because there's two different types of feed. There's the layer mash and then there's scratch, uh, scratch grain for the roosters. The layer mash are for the meat birds that are laying right now. And we mix it up very similar to how we did the pigs. We'll put the layer mash in here. We have the water right here and we'll mix it up fresh daily and just get make enough to feed them for the day. The reason we do that is we found that if we mix up too much, the layer mash, it starts to ferment pretty quickly. So yeah, and ferment past the point, past of, the point of being good. Of being a beneficial fermentation. So yeah. we just, we try to do a, a day, maybe two days worth of the yeah. time at, at most. Um, also, you'll notice fairly close to the hoop coops, we have mulch over here as well. And we use this for um, bedding purposes for the animals. So we can bring bedding over with a pitchfork, bring a wheelbarrow, whatever, and bring it in and give them some, um, some heavy bedding and they can scratch that up and we can use it to, to make compost. This little guy doesn't like to stay in his coop. He lives with these ones. There's two other ones in here, but he flies out but he doesn't leave this area. He stays up here the entire time and he kind of patrols around. So we've just let him do that. He gets fed out here. Yep, he prefers it. He likes to wander around the, the whole the perimeter. Whole, yep. <laughs> he really, really likes, he's very interested in the meat birds. So he'll probably end up being the rooster for the meat birds. Yeah. This netting here, Premier One has three, I think three styles of chicken netting. One that's highly portable that you would move on a daily basis and then one that's semi-permanent. And we're using the semi-permanent, actually this one is a highly portable one, um, just because we needed an extra one for the- The Rhode Island. For the Rhode Island roosters. But these here, for the three coops that are gonna stay here, these are the uh, semi-permanent stationary coops or netting because they're extra thick. You can pound them into the ground and they weigh a lot more. And so it's really hard to move them on a daily basis mm -hmm. and they're not meant for that. They're meant to have almost as a permanent netting system. Okay, let's continue on. We're gonna go show you what we're doing with the sheep right now and then show you um, some other stuff we have going on over here as we expand our operations and expand our usable pasture. All right, Winnie boy. So we haven't mentioned our livestock guardian dogs yet. Uh, they're more like farm guardian dogs. They don't guard just the livestock, they protect the entire farm. So this is Winston. He is a great Pyrenees. He's our first livestock guardian slash homestead guardian dog. We don't keep him with the animals specifically. We let him kind of roam around for a couple of reasons. One, we move the animals around so much and we also have the free range chickens. Uh, this guy, we got him I think it was May. May of last year. Of last year, yeah. So he's well a little over a year old, but he is really coming into his own and doing an excellent job uh, protecting and guarding the homestead as well as the animals. He loves being around the sheep. He's great with the chickens and he's often laying with the chickens while they're eating and mm -hmm. just, he does really, really well with the animals. He's very calm disposition, very yes. different than our other livestock guardian dog, Levi, yeah, we'll, who we'll introduce. We'll, we'll introduce you to Levi <laughs> uh, when we wake, make our way back. But right now we're up. So the house is over there. The gray barn is over here. And this is an area, it's about an acre, two acres. About an acre. Okay, that we had cleared. It used to be just full of these black cherry trees and melanthus trees and we actually had it cleared with a, a, a skid steer. We had somebody come out and clear it and it quickly started growing, overgrowing. So now this is all the regrowth of the unfortunate weeds and stuff that we don't want because they're not all of this is gonna be good foraging for animals. So we're putting the animals through it, letting them eat what they will, having them manure, and then we're gonna mow it and then we're gonna seed over it with better pasture type grasses 
some clover, some rye, some orchard timothy, things like that, that are gonna be just a good staple for the animals to graze in future. Yeah, and one of the challenges we have, just like any, any place, is you have to stay within the bounds of what your ecosystem allows mm -hmm. and the soil allows. So we have a clay soil here, so we'll find the right type of seed and grass that works well with the clay, but also does well for our for foragers, yeah. Yeah. And so what we're doing now is we're using the power of sheep <laughs> to keep this place under control. So what we have is the sheep are behind their sheep netting, uh, electrified with a, a portable solar uh, fence charger. One's charging and the other one's in use, and so I can swap them to make sure I always have a really hot charge on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> She's scratching and moving. <laughs> uh huh. Okay, so we have the sheep in the paddock. They have access to. Oh, this got wet. We'll have to change it. We got access to minerals right here, which you can't see with the camera. They have shelter. This is movable. They have water that's refreshed. And then they have free roam inside the paddock to eat whatever they want. This little paddock used to look like that two days ago and now it is coming down quite nicely. They probably have another day or two before we have to move them. Hi there. So we have named these. These are the Golden Girls. Dorothy here, Rose, Blanche, and Sophia. The purpose of the sheep here Again, two things, clearing land and eventually meat. We may have a third purpose. We may keep two of them as breeding stock and start a breeding program for, for the sheep. The sheep are Dorper Katahdin mix and the benefits are is we don't have to shear them because they are a hair sheep. And because they're a hair sheep, they don't produce the lanolin. So they're known for having a high quality of meat. We're probably putting two in the freezer and keeping the other two that are just showing better breed characteristics and also better temperaments as breeders. A lot of people will say, well, you should have gotten goats. And we find that uh, this breed of sheep, they'll eat just as much mm -hmm. as in the same type of stuff that goats will eat. They're just a little bit easier to contain. If we ever get the two pregnant, we could probably start milking them out and using them for milk, yes. just like you would be able to with, with goats. Yep, and we can use it for milk, we can make soap, and so that's a long term. If we do get more females and do start breeding them, we want to make sheep milk, sheep cheese, because that's like your Parmesans and things like that, as well as uh, the sheep soap down the road, of course. Yeah, that's that's definitely <laughs> down the road. We still have, we're still growing. We're only, we've only been on this pro property for a year and a half. So we still have a lot of learning to do. We mm -hmm. have a lot of setup to do. And right now we have our hands full with what we have. And so yeah. we're just going to start um, improving our situation slowly and mm -hmm. not try to rush into it <laughs> quite as fast as we did the first year. Yes. Just because we are finding ourselves overwhelmed with too much to do and it's really hard to maintain and then also have a little bit of progress. Expand. Expand, yeah. Yeah. In this area here, there is a pond right over there and that pond is is kind of a, it's not fed by anything but the runoff. And so mm -hmm. what we'll end up, end up doing is putting some gutters on the barn and having it drain into the pond. And we will bring the geese over and they will go into the pond. They'll aerate the pond, they'll eat the algae, eat some critters, eat some of the grass and stuff around mm -hmm. the bank to really help us maintain that pond. So one day this will be a beautiful sight to hold, but for now, we're excited to actually have water in the pond because when we got here, that was not holding water. Mm -hmm. It would heavy do heavy, heavy rains. It'd collect maybe a couple inches of, of water. And then within a couple days, it would just permeate back into the soil. Well, after we had the skid steer out here doing work and he went in there and compacted the, the soil, it's now holding water. And there's probably, I would say two to three feet of water in there at this at point. At least, yeah. So it has quite a bit more to hold. And as we do work on it, uh, it'll improve. And you can probably hear there's wildlife that's going back and enjoying it. So there's lots of different frogs, as well as, I don't know if you can see all the dragonflies, but there's probably, I can see at least six dragonflies, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason it's not cleared around the pond edges is it's, it's very steep, so it's really hard to get the mower without sliding down. Right. So we need to come in with like a weed whacker or something like that to get, to get the edges cleared out, yeah, but we'll, we'll do that. We'll, we'll clear the edges in um, fall. late fall or early winter when all of the foliage has died off and we can just, we can just uh, do it with a, some hand tools with, with ease. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing here now is this is the first time we've had a, a large food plot. Yes. This first row, we planted two different varieties of pumpkins. With these, the intent is, of course, we will eat the pumpkin and the pumpkin seeds, but a lot of it is going to be for the animals, especially towards winter and the fall when they run out of a lot of the other types of food. We wanted to make sure we had plenty of, you know, pumpkins and squashes and things like that to help supplement and give the animals fresh, fresh veggies. And then in this one, we, we went ahead and planted sunflowers and beans. Those were the two primary crops in here and those will be okay. We did an experiment where we were about two weeks late planting the melons for the last date that you should plant them in our region. And so the melons most likely are going to struggle. We think we'll get them almost to being fully mature. So our thought is we'll probably build some type of hoop over it with some plastic to keep it in case there's a freeze before we're able to harvest them. And we planted these just a few days ago. Yeah. So we're not seeing any sort of growth yet, which is fine. And to keep the stuff from growing back up again, we just put down tarps. But we basically just want to try to minimize how many weeds there are between the pumpkin runners. So we're going to train the pumpkins to go different directions. So that way they can spread out and it'll be easy for us to find the pumpkins because they'll be on top of the tarp and not inside a bunch of weeds. We don't know where we want to put permanent roots mm -hmm. yet. And so a lot of the stuff that we're doing uh, is temporary by design to allow us to be portable, to move. And uh, once we figure out where water runs during heavy rains, where the heavy winds hit during uh, wind season, um, or actually all year round we get heavy winds, then we'll know better where to put roots and establish permanency. So for now, we're just adding nutrients into the soil with the animals and then also with the gardening. All right, let's head back. We have two more garden plots to show you and then we'll wrap it up. This is the second year we've used this little strip. We had one of our neighbors come and just <laughs> use this tractor yeah. and just till up two rows for us. We decided to put raised beds on this side this year. We Last year this was all just tilled and we only used it really for potatoes last year. So this year we have cucumbers and beets and radishes and peas and cilantro all kind of in the different raised beds. And we found that these screens, while they're not the most attractive, they work excellent to help keeping your cilantro from bolting. And we planted a lot of cilantro because I love cilantro, but I need to get out here and harvest it. Yeah, we use those screens. We actually have three more screens laying down right there. We use them up here for the cucumbers and for the beets in their early growing stages because it is east facing and it's just getting, sorry, it's west facing and it's just getting tons of sun throughout the day. So those are struggling without the shade. We're doing the same thing with the screen for our peas. Our peas. Mm -hmm. They like more shade. And the radishes, these are now uh, overdue. We need to replant, but the radishes were fine in direct sun. Yeah, and this is our potatoes. This was our first succession of potatoes in the mounds directly behind this raised bed are the second succession of potatoes, which are not- They're not coming up. They're not coming well. up as uh, strong. Yeah. yeah. We did an experiment that I think we waited a little too long. In between the rows of potatoes, we did plant lettuces, but I think we waited until the potatoes were, leaves were a little too big so that they didn't get enough sun in the early stages. So we'll try that again, probably next year and plant the lettuces a little sooner because the whole intent of doing something like that is to have the lettuces be shaded 
by the potato plants so that they don't bolt as quickly and you get a better harvest. Yeah, and I didn't know that we were gonna be planting lettuce between the rows. So the rows of potatoes are pretty close to each other. Yeah. So the lettuce really didn't have that much of a chance. I would have doubled the distance between the potato hills to allow the lettuce to come up. Yeah. And this one here, we just have potato cuts directly on the ground and then I mounted compost on top of it. And this one, we have potato seed cuts on some ground cover and then mounted with compost. And here you'll see we have uh, just a trash can full of water. And I'll come in here with a waterer and use just a hand waterer and use it to water this on days where we don't have rain. That works out really well. And we're just a few feet from the house. We're not very far from it, so it's easy to stretch a hose and fill up that. And then our final uh, garden is we have two raised beds. We actually have th uh, four, four raised beds, but those are just just getting started. We haven't planted anything in them. But we have two raised beds that we put in front of the house here. And, and these are gonna be kitchen garden. So the, the thought and idea behind this is to put herbs and things that you would, you know, want to grab for a quick dinner or, you know, that you would want to use with your kitchen. So currently it's lettuces, so we've got chard. We've got a lot of basil growing in here. We just planted um, some pepper plants as well. And then we do have one basil and one chive that are growing. And then in the, the other two, once we get those planted, we'll probably have tomatoes in the heart-shaped one where we'll have some tomatoes around and then likely we'll plant some more herbs. Maybe, you know, some rosemary and some thyme and some things like that. Let's go check out the burger that we have inside. Oh yeah. <laughs> the first stage of the chickens. <laughs> this is the brooder box. This is currently where we have 10 black Osterlobe hens, pullets, and we have five black Cochins, and then the little yellow one in there is the surprise chick that comes with every order. So these little ones will be in here for about another five or six days, and then they will go out to one of those gray temporary coops, and they'll be out on grass. So we are now on the north side of the house, which is the back side of the house, and we processed a couple chickens, some roosters the other day, and we have haven't put away all this stuff yet, so I wanted to show it to you. So we have our plucker, we have our scalder, we have a couple barrels for ice bath tables and stuff. This stuff is out for the processing. This is where we process our chickens. And we process them here because we have easy access to water and power inside the basement area of the back of the house. So here's access to water. Actually, this is the same spigot that we use for the free range chicken area. And then we have access to power down here. And then we house our uh, meat freezers here. So we have, I think we have all the pigs in here and we have the chickens in there. And then we store all of our equipment and stuff right down here. It stays a little bit cooler, stays a little bit cleaner and out of the weather. And so here we have Levi. He's the newest member of the family <laughs> in terms of our dog family. Yep. And he is an Anatolian Shepherd Great Pyrenees mix. We got him when he was six months old in December. And so he's just, just turned a year, a little over a year. So he's a little bit more hyper, but he is an excellent aerial predator dog meaning he detects them and he's very keen on protecting the chickens. He's a sweet boy though, and they get along really, really well. Yeah, they're, they're best of friends, but yeah. definitely this boy is the boss. Yes. He is definitely the boss. Yep, which is good because he has the more calm demeanor. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so for a year and a half and for a couple newbies, I think we've done a pretty spectacular job yeah. at getting the stuff set up and functioning and having what we have. I mean, it's a lot to learn. I mean, there's so much to learn when yep. it comes to raising animals, mm -hmm. raising your own food, clearing land, 
fixing a house, all the things that we've been doing in the last Processing year. Processing your own food yep. on property. It, yeah. yeah, there's just, there's a lot. And I was inspired by a bunch of YouTube videos. You grew up with this stuff with your, with your grandfather. <laughs> and we both really just wanted to give this a try. And so even though there's been many, many, many days of frustration <laughs> and hardship and it's constant work, there's no time off. Yep. Uh, it's definitely rewarding. It's been, it's been a journey. So looking forward to seeing what the next year and a half looks like. Yep. But until then, thanks for watching. <laughs> See you on the next one. Yep. Take care. Bye. Bye.